All right, so I got this cool book. I'm really enjoying it. It's called Toxic Parents. It's by Dr. Susan Forward. And um, it's it's uh, explaining a lot of things that actually happened uh, during my childhood. And it turns out that it's typical. Um, a lot of people have gone through having emotionally uh, uh, destroying, uh, emotionally destructive parents. So, introduction. Sure, my father used to hit me, but he did. He only did it to keep me in line. I don't see what that has to do with my marriage falling apart, said Gordon. Gordon was a 38, a successful orthopedic surgeon. He came to see me when his wife of six years had left him. He was desperate to get her come back, but she told him that she wouldn't even consider coming home until he sought help for his uncontrollable temper. She was frightened by his sudden outburst and worn down by his relentless criticism. Gordon knew that he had a hot temper and that he could be a nag, but still he was shocked when his wife walked out. I asked Gordon to tell me about himself and guide him with a few questions as he talked. When I asked him about his parents, he smiled and he painted a glowing picture, especially of his father, a distinguished Midwestern cardiologist. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't have become a doctor. He's the best. All His patients all think that he's a saint. I asked him what his relationship with his father was like now. He laughed nervously and he said, It was great until I told him that I was thinking about going into holistic medicine. You'd think I'd want it to be a mass murder. I told him about three months ago. And now every time we, we talk, he starts ranting about how he didn't send me to medical school to become a faith healer. It got bad. It got it really got bad yesterday. He got upset and he told me I should forget that I was ever a part of the family. That really hurt. I don't know. Maybe holistic medicine isn't such a good idea. While Gordon was describing his father, who was obviously not as wonderful as Gordon would have liked me to believe, I noticed that he began to clasp and unclasp his hands in a very agitated way. When he caught himself doing this, he restrained himself by placing his fingertips together in the way that professors often do at their desk. It seemed a gesture he might have picked up from his father. I asked Gordon whether his father had always been so tyrannical. No, not really. I mean, he yelled and screamed a lot, and I got spanked once in a while, like any other kid, but I wouldn't call him a tyrant. Something about the way he said the word spanked, some subtle emotional change in his voice struck me. I asked him about it. It turned out that his father had spanked him two or three times with a belt. It hadn't taken much for Gordon to incur a beating. A defiant word, a below-par report card, or a forgotten chore were all sufficiently venal crimes. Nor was Gordon's father particular about where he beat his child. Gordon recalled being beaten on his back, his legs, his arms, his hands, and his buttocks. I asked Gordon how badly his father had physically hurt him. Gordon says, I didn't bleed or anything. I mean, I turned out okay. He just needed to keep me in line. But you were scared of him, weren't you? I was scared to death. But isn't that the way it's supposed to be with parents? Gordon, is that how you'd want your children to fear about you? Gordon avoided my eyes. This was making him extremely uncomfortable. I pulled my, my chair closer and continued gently. Your wife is a pediatrician. If she saw a child in her office with the same marks on his body that you had on yours from one of your father's spankings, would she be required by law to report it to the authorities? Gordon didn't have to answer. His eyes filled with tears at the realization. He whispered, I'm getting a terrible knot in my stomach. Gordon's defenses were down. Though he was in a terrible emotional pain, he had uncovered for the first time the primary, long-hidden source of his temper. He had been containing a volcano of anger against his father since childhood, and whenever the pressure got too great, he would erupt at whoever was handy, usually his wife. I knew what we had to do, acknowledge and heal the battered little boy inside of him. When I got home that evening, I found myself still thinking about Gordon. I kept seeing his eyes filled with tears as he realized how he had been mistreated. I thought about the thousands of adult men and women with whom I had worked whose daily lives were being influenced, even controlled by patterns set during childhood by emotionally destructive parents. And I realized there must be millions more who had no idea why their lives weren't working, yet who could be helped. That's why I decided to write this book. So why look back? Gordon's story is not unusual. I've seen thousands of patients in my 18 years as a therapist, both in private practice and in hospital groups, and a solid majority have suffered a damning sense of self-worth because a parent had regularly hit them or criticized them or joked about how stupid or ugly or unwanted that they were or overwhelmed them with guilt or sexually abused them or forced too much responsibility on them or desperately overprotected them. Like Gordon, few of these people made the connection between their parents and their problems. 
This is a common emotional blind spot. People simply have trouble seeing that their relationship with their parents has a major impact on their lives. Therapeutic trends, which used to rely heavily on the analysis of early life experiences, have moved away from the then and into the here and now. The emphasis has shifted to examining and changing current behavior, relationships, and functioning. I believe this shift is due to clients' rejection of the enormous amounts of time and money required for many traditional therapies, often for minimal results. I'm a great believer in short-term therapy that focuses on changing destructive behavior patterns, but my experience has taught me that it's not enough to treat the symptoms. You must also deal with the sources of those symptoms. Therapy is most effective when it proceeds down a double track, both changing current self-defeating behavior and disconnecting from the traumas of the past. Gordon had to learn techniques to control his anger, but in order to make permanent changes, ones that would stand up under stress, he also had to go back and deal with the pain of his childhood. Our parents plant mental and emotional seeds in us, seeds that grow as we do. In some families, these are seeds of love, respect, and independence, but in many others, they're seeds of fear and obligation or guilt. If you belong to the second group, this book is for you. As you grew into adulthood, these seeds grew into invisible weeds that invaded your life in ways you never dreamed of. Their tendrils may have harmed your relationships, your career, or your family. They have certainly undermined your self-confidence and self-esteem. I'm going to help you find those weeds and root them out. What is a toxic parent? All parents are deficient from time to time. I made some terrible mistakes with my children, which caused them and me considerable pain. No parent can be emotionally available all the time. It's perfectly normal for parents to yell at their children once in a while. All parents occasionally become too controlling, and most parents speak spank their children, even if rarely. Do these lapses make them cruel and unsuitable parents? Of course not. Parents are only human, and they have plenty of problems of their own. And most children can deal with an occasional outburst of anger, as long as they have plenty of love and understanding to counter it. But there are many parents whose negative patterns of behavior are consistent and dominant in the child's life. These are the parents who do the harm. As I searched for a phrase to describe the common ground that these harmful parents share, the word that kept running through my mind was toxic. Like a chemical toxin, the emotional damage inflicted by these parents spreads throughout a child's being. And as the child grows, so does the pain. What better word than toxic to describe parents who inflict ongoing trauma, abuse, and denigration on their children, and in most cases continue to do so even after their children are grown. There are exceptions to the ongoing or repetitive aspects of this definition. Sexual or physical abuse can be so traumatic that often a single occurrence is enough to cause tremendous emotional damage. Unfortunately, parenting, one of our most crucial skills, is still very much a seat of the pants endeavor. Our parents learned it primarily from people who may not have done a good job, such as their parents. Many of the time-honored techniques that have been passed down from generation to generation are quite simply bad advice masquerading as wisdom. Remember, spare the rod and spoil the child? What do toxic parents do to you? Whether adult children of toxic parents were beaten when little or left alone too much, sexually abused or treated like fools, overprotected or overburdened by guilt, they almost all suffer surprisingly similar symptoms, damaging self-esteem, leading to self-destructive behavior. In one way or another, they almost all feel worthless, unlovable, and inadequate. These feelings stem to a great degree from the fact that children of toxic parents blame themselves for their parents' abuse, sometimes consciously, sometimes not. It's easier for a defenseless, dependent child to feel guilty for having done something bad to deserve, to deserve daddy's rage than it is for that child to accept the frightening fact that daddy, the protector, cannot be trusted. When these children become adults, they continue to bear these buildings of burdens of guilt and inadequacy, making it extremely difficult for them to develop a positive self-image. The resulting lack of confidence and self-worth can, in turn, color every aspect of their lives. So freeing yourself from the legacy of toxic parents. You are an adult child of toxic parents. There are many things you can do to free yourself from their distorted legacy of guilt and self-doubt. I'll be discussing these various strategies throughout this book, and I want you to proceed with a great deal of hope. Not the deluded hope that your parents will magically change, but the realistic hope that you can psychologically unhook from the powerful and destructive influence of your parents. You must have to find the courage. It is within you. I'll be guiding you through a series of steps that will help you see this influence clearly and then deal with it, regardless of whether you are currently in conflict with your parents. Whether you have a civil but surface relationship, whether you haven't seen them for years, or even if one or both are dead, 
Strange as it may seem, many people are still controlled by their parents after their deaths. The ghosts that haunt them may not be real in a supernatural sense, but they're very real in the psychological in the psychological sense. Um yeah, so the ghosts, uh, the, uh, but they're real in a psychological sense. So a parent's demands, expectations, and guilt trips can linger long after that parent has died. You may already have recognized your need to free yourself from your parents' influence. Maybe you've even confronted them about it. One of my clients was fond of saying, My parents don't have any control over my life. I hate them, and they know it. But later on, she came to realize that by fanning the flames of her anger, her parents are still manipulating her. The energy she put into her anger was a drain on other parts of her life. Confrontation is an important step in exercising the ghosts of the past and the demons of the present, but it must never be done in the heat of anger. Aren't I supposed to be responsible for the way I am? By now you may be thinking, wait a minute, Susan. Almost all other books and experts say I can't blame anyone else for my problems. That's horse shit. Your parents are accountable, accountable for what they did. Of course you're responsible for your adult life. But that life was largely shaped by experiences over which you had no control. The fact is, you are not responsible for what you have done, for what was done to you as a defenseless child. You are responsible for taking positive steps to do something about it now. We're beginning an important journey together. It's a journey of truth and discovery. At its end, you'll find yourself far more in charge of your life than ever before. I'm not going to make grandiose assurances about your problems, problems disappearing magically overnight. But if you have the courage and strength to do the work in this book, you will be able to reclaim from your parents much of the power due to you as an adult and most of the dignity due to you as a human being. This work does carry an emotional price tag. Once you peel away your defenses, you'll discover feelings of rage, anxiety, hurt, confusion, and especially grief. The destruction of your lifelong image of your parents can elicit powerful feelings of loss and abandonment. I want you to approach the material in this book at your own pace. If some of the work makes you uncomfortable, give it plenty of time. What's important here is progress, not speed. To illustrate the concepts in this book, I've drawn heavily on case histories from practice. Some have been directly transcribed from tape recordings while I've reconstructed others from my notes. All the letters in this book are from my files and have been reproduced exactly as they were written. The unrecorded therapy sessions I've reconstructed are still vivid in my memory and I've made every effort to recreate them just as they occurred. Only names and identifying circumstances have been changed for legal reasons. None of these cases have been dramatized. These cases may seem sensational, but in fact, they're typical. I did not search my files for the most provocative or dramatic cases. Rather, I chose cases that most clearly represent the types of stories I hear every day. The issues I will raise in this book are not aberrations of the human condition. They are a part of it. This book is divided into two sections. In the first, we'll examine how different types of toxic parents operate. We'll explore various ways in which your parents might have hurt you and still might be hurting you. This understanding will prepare you for the second section, in which I'll give you specific behavioral techniques to enable you to reverse the balance of power in your relationships with your toxic parents. The process of diminishing the negative power of your parents is a gradual one, but it will eventually release your inner strength, the self that's been hiding all these years, the unique and loving person you're meant to be. Together, we'll help free that person so that your life can finally be your own. Part 1. Toxic Parents Godlike Parents, the myth of the perfect parent The ancient Greeks had a problem. The Greeks looked down from their ethereal playground atop Mount Olympus and passed judgment on everything the Greeks were up to. And if the gods weren't pleased, they were swift to punish. They didn't even, they didn't have to be kind, they didn't have to be just, they didn't have to be right. In fact, they could be downright irrational. At their whim, they could turn you into an echo or make you push a boulder uphill for all eternity. Needless to say, they just didn't even, uh, needless to say, the unpredictable, these powerful gods sowed quite a bit of fear and confusion among their mortal followers. Not unlike many toxic parent-child relationships, an unpredictable parent is a fearsome god in the eyes of a child. When we were very young, our godlike parents are everything to us. Without them, we would be unloved, unprotected, unhoused, and unfed, living in a constant state of terror, knowing we were unable to survive alone. They're all... They were our all-powerful providers, and, and we need they supply. With nothing and no one to judge them against, we assume them to be perfect parents. As the world broadens beyond our crib, we develop a need to maintain this image of perfection as a defense against the great unknowns we increasingly encounter. 
As long as we believe our parents are perfect, we feel protected. That's part one.